Welcome to Slate Church Online. We are so glad that you're tuning in today, and we pray that this message will bless you no matter where you're watching from. If this message impacts you today, we would love to hear about it. Send an email to mystory@slatechurch.com. Welcome Pastor Brandon up to the platform. All right, we're going to try something different tonight, and we're going to do a standing preach. Everybody's going to stand the entire time. (laughs) There's some people already taking a seat. I I will mention, you can take a seat, that the first person to sit down with this look on their face, by the way, was my mother-in-law. She she knows my behavior. (laughs) I've I've been in your family for 10 years. That's crazy, isn't it? You wish it had been longer. Uh, Guys, it's so good to be here. I'm really excited to speak this message and uh, really thankful that Evernote changed their entire thing. Did they change it for iPad too? No, I don't think so. Just uh, desktop because they don't care about pastors. Anyway, um, (laughs) nothing against Evernote. Uh, How's everybody doing tonight? It tends to get loudest where you look. You're like, who's excited for church? You're like children. You're like my children. (laughs) Only listening when I'm looking at you. All right. Um, I'm kidding. My kids are very well behaved. They're not going to be, they're not going to fall into that typical pastor's kid trap. You know, my kids are awesome. And uh, guys, it's just so exciting to be here. And uh, really excited to preach what, what's, what's on my heart tonight. And uh, I've never not been excited to preach what's on my heart. That's honestly the, the truth. Uh, what pastor, you know, I was saying this in the morning service a couple of weeks ago, like what pastor gets up from the stage and they're like, well, not really excited to preach what God's placed on my heart tonight. Good luck for the rest of you, you know. It just doesn't happen. But tonight, uh, I think, coming out of last week, uh, we had Vision Sunday last week. And the theme uh, that came out of last week was fan into flame. Turn to somebody and say, fan into flame. Who's wearing a fan into flame shirt right now? (laughs) No, no, half of you that just put up your hands are not wearing fan into flame shirts. (laughs) That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Um, okay, anyway, that's our, that's our theme. And this morning, Luke preached an incredible message about saying, Lord, here I am, send me, and being obedient to what we hear when we, when we hear that. But he, he brought up a lot of stuff that I'm actually going to be preaching about tonight. And uh, I think that's what it should say to us as a church, is that God's trying to speak something very specific to us, which is like, let's start to ignite that which he's placed inside of us. Let's not just hold and carry and coddle the things that he's placed inside of us, but let's release all that God's placed inside of us so that we can see... A world come to understand who he is. All right? All right, so uh, we just want to welcome everybody that's, uh, maybe it's your first time in church and you're still trying to figure out what, what's, what's going on. You're like, all these people are lifting up their hands. And don't worry, it's nothing that you don't see elsewhere in society, sometimes at a hockey game or uh, people just start getting excited about things they're passionate about. And so we want to welcome you into this place. We're just passionate about Jesus. And although that's kind of odd in the world that we live in today, we've looked in the same place as everybody else has looked. But it is our resolve that Jesus is the one who satisfies all. And so welcome to our home. All right, I want to tell a little bit of a story, and it starts in the Garden of Eden. Every story starts in the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve were, were, were planted, uh, not really, but like they're placed there. Uh, all the trees and stuff were planted there, and they're in good relationship with Jesus, right? Uh, if you know the story of Adam and Eve, if you went to Bible school, this is a story that made you giggle. You're like, oh, they're naked, you know? Like, no, just me? <laughs> okay, all right, well, I'll keep preaching from there, all right. Um, they, you know, they're naked. They felt no shame. It was, it, was, it was awesome. Everything was awesome there. I think that's a pretty good world where you're just naked and unashamed. Am I, like, am I the only one that reads the Bible with some sort of interest in what it has to say? 
That's a brilliant world. I love that world. But unfortunately, they did the one thing <laughs> that, uh, that uh, you shouldn't do, which is you ate, ate from the one tree that Jesus or God at that time told them not to eat from. It's like, hey, you can do anything you want, but don't do this one thing. And us as humans are like, don't, don't touch that thing over there. You know, this is, that's my son every day. Don't touch it, Theo. He's like, like, no. He's the cutest little thing. Anyway, uh, you had to be there. But uh, the truth is, is they made this bad decision, and ever, ever since that decision took place, God was not out to harm his children. He wasn't out to get his children. He wasn't trying to do something against humanity. God loved humanity so much that he set his plan of redemption in place from that moment, trying to draw humanity back into the original relationship, which is to be in an everlasting relationship with him. And, and for, for all of eternity, right? And so this is what he tries to do. And he chooses a group of people, a family that, uh, that stem from a guy named Israel. This is where we get the Israelites from. This is where we get the nation of Israel from. And for a period of time, God would use this nation in order to bring about his son. But in the middle of that, and at the very, really at the very beginning of that, the very people he had chosen to bring about his plan of bringing the world back into relationship with him, which is what we call redemption, he actually, uh, the, the, the nation he had chosen actually went into slavery. I, the truth is, is that if we just read the story and just go like, wow, God really cares about his people, and, and you start to develop a little bit of a, a, resentful, a resentful idea of who God is, and you start, to, under, you start to, to, to question who he is and his motives and wondering, why would he allow his children to go into slavery? The truth is, is that if we just stop at reading the Bible at the parts that we don't like, we don't get to read the rest of the story, which is everything God ever did was so that we could be sitting here praising his name, free from all the things that Try to entangle us and worship him for eternity. It's an unfortunate part of the history, but Israel is in captivity, and there's one man that is born. His name is Moses. Everybody say, hey, Mo. Hey, Mo. Mo was a, an, an incredible guy. His story started when the Egyptian ruler who had, uh, his name was Pharaoh, who had all the Israelites under captivity began to realize that these people just kept multiplying. They kept multiplying. They're like rabbits. The Israelites were like rabbits. They just kept multiplying. The story goes a lot like this. He says like, whoa, there's a lot of people being born to the Israelites. We should kill all the children. And so he tells the people that are delivering the children, kill the children. And then the, the nurses that are delivering the children don't Kill the children, thank God. But he goes like, what, what is wrong with you? Why aren't you killing the children? And I, I can just imagine the midwives at this time being like, what's wrong with us? What's wrong with you? Like, they're just, they're just multiplying. But they say, the Israelite women are not like the Egyptian woman. They actually push out the children before we get there, and we can't actually deliver them ourselves. They just kept multiplying. And so he says, okay, well, I'll, I'll take care of this myself. And he says, any of the boys two years younger uh, two years or younger, they should be thrown into the Nile and drowned. What an incredible time to come into the world. This is the, the, the landscape by which Moses came into the world. And Moses, in an ironic fashion, was not thrown into the Nile to drown, but placed into the Nile to actually uh, save the Israelites by the end of his life. Isn't it amazing that sometimes the thing that was set out to kill you can actually be your pathway to allowing God to do all the things he wants to do through you? Somebody might be out to get you, but what if that was your through way to actually seeing God do all the things he needs to do through you? And so Moses is born, and he sees one day his people, the Israelites, being mistreated. He goes out, and he tries to defend them, but it, and accidentally kills a man. Not so accidentally, he actually looks one way, looks the other way. He's like, this is a good opportunity. Kills the guy, and he gets found out, so he runs away. Moses has been in the desert for about 40 years at this point. He ran to a place called Midian, and in Midian, he met this, these women that were uh, drawing water from a well, and a bunch of shepherds came by and tried to drive these women away, but Moses stepped in, and thank God he did because uh, the, the girls went and told their, their dad, and their dad's like, dude, this guy is awesome. One of you guys should marry him. And so one of the girls marries him, and then he, from that point, he's been in the desert for 40 years. Well, Moses is shepherding himself now. And in Exodus chapter 3, which, which is where we're going to find ourselves uh, tonight, 
it says this. It says, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. I wish my father-in-law had some sheep. Wouldn't that be cool? We got a lot of other stuff, but we don't have sheep. I'd be totally down for shepherding your sheep, Jason. Like, this guy's like so weird. What kind of relationship does he have with his, with his in-laws? Anyway, um, it says he was uh, shepherding his father. Let's see where this is. I try to bring my bigger Bible every week, and I forget, and then I use this tiny little Bible, which I need glasses for, but I can't wear my glasses because the light comes off the back of my glasses, shines in my eye, and then I mess it up anyway, and so I don't know what it is about small Bibles. Just buy large print Bibles right from the start. It'll carry you all the way into your old age. Amen. Exodus chapter 3. It says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb. A lot of scholars believe that he just led them there because he had nothing better to do. Literally just led them across the desert. Like, what am I going to do today? Well, I guess I'll lead these sheep all the way across the desert. And so he leads them all the way to this place called Horeb, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Everybody say, ooh. This is kind of spooky. I love it because this place where God shows up to Moses is actually the place where God would lead Moses after he frees the people from Israel. And sometimes God is just familiarizing you with an area so that he can actually do some stuff through you and familiarize yourself where, where he wants to bring you. But he's going to bring you away from it to bring you back to that place. And you just need to know that sometimes you're doing what you're doing because God needs to do something through you that only you can do. And he can't use anybody else for. And so Moses is here and all of a sudden this burning bush is going and, and, and he's like, well, that's weird. So Moses thought, or Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. Good idea, Moses. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Mo, Mo. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Holy meaning set apart. This place is set apart. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, who was also known as Israel. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the mis misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering." So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Come on. I, you know, I don't know why that's a good thing. Like, I'm going to bring you to a place with milk and honey. And Moses is like, yeah, that's awesome. Let's pray. Jesus we come here today not to just get stirred up or hyped up. God, we come here today because we want to know what your spirit has to say to us. We need to know your word. We need it in order to go out into this world that we live in and reveal your love. We need it in order to glorify you. So God, please speak to us tonight, we pray. Pray all this in Jesus' name. And everybody said. Amen. Come on, and everybody said. Amen. And everybody said. Amen. All right. Um. I wonder if you've ever had to live with something that uh, that that maybe it wasn't wasn't chosen, but but just something that you you you've had to live with. You know, some people might relate to sicknesses. Maybe some people uh, are, are are thinking of something else. I don't mean your spouse. Like you, you didn't get to choose your spouse. I, I'm not not going in that direction. I get to live with my spouse. I don't have to live with her. You know what I'm saying? Like, well, I kind of have to because I married her, but. You know what I'm trying to say. I get to live with Emma, and uh, and it's it's incredible. I'm more, I'm more talking about these little quirks of your personality that you just can't seem to get away from. I'm talking about the thing like like you're just a clumsy person. Do we have any clumsy people in the room? Careful, don't hit anybody with your hand going up. All right. Uh, you know, maybe it's that like you're just rid ridiculously ridiculously good looking. Anybody have that problem in the room? I love you, man. <laughs> You're awesome. <laughs> I have that problem, too. And, uh, but, but I was born with a particular uh, uh, gifting, a particular uh, spiritual gift, I would say. 
And, uh, and, it, and it's, it's called the gift of Moses. Yeah, it's the gift of Moses. It's very spiritual. In fact, that's what my, my mom and dad would call it. They would say, they would, they would actually call me Moses growing up. My birth name is Brandon. My, my middle name, which is not your surname, I don't think, is, is Hunter. But, but my real spiritual name is Moses. And they would call me Moses, I, I thought, out of, out of it just being a flattering saying. My sister right now is laughing. Um, because I thought, like, this is a good thing. Like, I'm called a hero of the Bible. Like, this is, this is actually a really good thing to be called. But I began to realize over time, and it took me a little while. You'll, you'll understand that in a second. It took me a little while to understand why I was called Moses. Because really the reason my parents were calling me Moses is because I'm incredibly slow. See, Moses took 40, no, M- Moses took 40 years to understand his calling from God and then took 40 years to lead the Israelites into the promised land and still didn't make it. And so anytime my parents were wondering what the heck Brandon was doing, they said, Moses, where are you and what is taking you so long? I, I swear, like, I was the child in our family that my family would be in the van halfway to Toronto. They'd be like, darn, where's Brandon? And they'd have to drive back and get me. I remember working with my father, and we worked in Peterborough together. We lived in Coburg, so it was about a 45-minute drive. My dad would make, wake me up at an ungodly hour of the day, like 4.45. He'd come knock on my door. Because fathers do not know how to wake up their children nicely. You know, my mom's just, hey, Brandon. Brandon, buddy. To get my head like a massage, that's kind of weird. Time to wake up. My dad, like, Brandon! We gotta work. <laughs> you know, just like going crazy on me. And uh, you know, ten minutes would go by, he'd yell down the stairs, and I'm still trying to wonder why he like he's not even aware of the other people in the house that don't need to wake up at five a.m. And he's like, ten minutes later, like, you ready? I yell up like, yes. And, you know, ten minutes later, hey, you, you almost ready? I'd be like, yes. It'd be like five thirty, the time that we we're supposed to leave, and my dad's like, all right, I'm leaving. The car's going. I'm like. All right, just let me have a shower, brush my teeth, make some eggs. You know, I try to fit it all in. I'm like, I got three minutes. I've scheduled it. I prepared. I can do it. We have a saying at our church, if you're five minutes early, you're ten minutes late. And this saying has been the death of me ever since we started Slate Church. Like, if I'm five minutes early, you're probably dead. <laughs> you know? But no, I've been really working on it because I'm just a slow person. It's something I've had to live with. It's my, uh, my cross to bear. <laughs> My wife is losing her lid. Um, but but the, but but truthfully, Moses, Moses and I had something in common. Moses just like he was living with the fact that it was taking him a long time to come to a realization of what God was trying to do through him. You know, like, when we talk in Slate Church about, like, God wanting to fulfill the purpose and destiny in your life, he's got great things for your life. He's going to do such great things through you. Like, like most of us are like, yeah, like, this year I'm going to do everything that God has told me to do. A lot of us are like, yeah, five-year plan. God is going to. Moses' plan for his life was 40 years long. Like, a lot of us are like, I don't even know what I'm doing next week. Moses is like, yeah, when I'm 60, I'll start acting on the things that God placed in me. I just want to remind anybody that's in here and, like, I'm too old to be used by God. Can I remind you that Moses took 40 years to start living out the purpose and calling that God placed on his life? You are not too old. I hate that excuse. It's like, well, I'm 60. I'm in retirement, and therefore I can just coast through the rest of life. Er, Wrong. It's totally wrong. You should be alive. What more does God have for you? What more is God going to do through you? What more does God want to bring you up to and set you up for for his glory? I think we should have a better perspective. But I think for some other of us that don't, maybe don't have to wait till that 40 year, maybe some of us need to realize that we're on the 40 year trek without even intending to be. And we need to start waking up because every day we wake up and we say, yeah, I'm going to get to that tomorrow. It, we, we keep getting to that tomorrow and, yeah, I'll get it to tomorrow. And some of us have been saying that for a year, two years, five years, ten years, twenty years. And it's time to say, am I going to wake up to all the things that God's trying to speak to me? Because I don't need to live with this any longer. Come on, what are you living with today? What's, what's living on the inside of you? Moses had a lot living on the inside of him that caused it to be a better 40-year delay. What is living in you? Moses had a lot of things living in him. He had a lot of guilt living in him. He had killed a guy. 
the very people that he wanted to save and be a part of helping, he actually killed, and he thought that it actually crossed him out of being able to help them. Moses was, 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 had, a, had a lot living on the inside of him. He was hiding. He was helping incessantly with his father-in-law's sheep, and not just because he liked sheep, but because he was busying himself. He's busying himself with work. He was having children. He was doing all these things. In fact, Moses' life sounds a lot like a lot of our lives when we get out of the groove of asking God what he wants to do in our lives. Getting busy with work, having kids, staying away from guilt, putting those areas out of our mind. And so many of us, by doing that day after day after day, find ourselves in a very similar place that we never thought we would be, which is living in a world of purposelessness. I want to encourage you today that no matter where you find yourself, that God actually wants to use you to accomplish his kingdom's purposes. I want to remind you today that no matter what you've been through, there is still something that God wants to do through you. It doesn't matter what's happened to you. It doesn't matter what you've done to somebody else. It doesn't matter what you think has excluded you or, or, or not allowed you to move forward. It does not matter. What matters is when God says go, we actually go. When God says yes, we actually agree. When God says you're able, we actually lean into that. God has something for every one of us in this place. You know, the truth is, is that what's living inside of us will eventually come out of us. You know, what, what's in you will, will eventually show around you. What, what's actually happening in you, you can't hide it for so long that nobody will actually realize that it's, that it's inside of you. Moses thought he had shoved some of the stuff that he had done back in Egypt. He thought he had shoved it down so far that nobody was going to be able to. I don't think, I, based on what we're given, it doesn't seem like Moses' family knew what he did back in Egypt. I don't think that they realized that he grew up in Pharaoh's palace as one of the richest people in the world and uh, enjoying all of the luxuries of life. I don't think that his family actually realized that. I don't think his family realized that he was a murderer that looked this way and that way and that way and killed a man and tried to get away, for, away with it. Moses had pushed those things so deep inside of himself that he thought it was gone. But here's the crazy thing about shoving things deep inside of yourself so far down that you think they're gone. They almost always surface when we least expect it. Come on, one of the best things that you can do as a person is just surface the things that are, are, are going to surface anyway. No, no, I mean it. Like, I was, I was the kind of kid growing up that would tell on myself. Anybody like that? Literally, I would do something wrong on the playground. I would always fight with my friend Ryan Cochran. We would always, boom, boom, boom. I taught, knocked out his tooth one day on the bus, and I immediately ran off the bus. I ran into the school hallway. I'm tracing it in my mind. I ran down the school hallway. I did it zigzag all the way to the principal's office. I ran in. And I said, Principal Walt, I just knocked out Ryan's tooth. And she's like, why are you telling me this? Like, I don't care, you know. School was different back then. <laughs> I don't know what they're doing today, but school was different back then. I used to tell on myself. But the truth is, is that what I learned about telling on myself is that if I could surface things myself, they were dealt with a lot quicker. If I could just surface things to my parents, that could be dealt with a lot quicker. If I could just surface things to the people around me, I could deal with it much quicker. I think Moses would have done well if he had to just surface some of these things much earlier rather than being caught around in his old age just trying to push it all down. <coughs> I'm not suggesting that we go home today and just let everybody know all the bad things that are going through our minds and all the rest. But I do know that there is one who we can open to, up to at any point in our, in our day at any point during our, our busy schedules, at any point when we think that we can't handle it all, and, and we, we, can just, we can just say these words, we can say, God, I don't know if I can deal with X. It says in God's word that there's a brother that sits closer than a friend. Jesus is there. He's as close as a mention of his name. And some of us need to actually surface things a little bit earlier. <clears throat> what lives in us will eventually show on us. So I wonder what you've been living with. I wonder what you've been going through. I wonder the things that you've been pondering. I wonder, you know, what you've been pushing down. Maybe you don't believe in yourself the same way your spouse believes in you. Maybe it's that you don't trust yourself the way that other people around you trust you. Maybe it's that you feel like you've built an entire facade that nobody really knows the real you. But uh, today I want to I suggest that no matter what you're living with, it's time to start living with the fire of God. 
I, I, want, I want to start suggesting today that it's, it's actually time to start living with a fire inside of you. It's time to start living with a purpose burning deep inside of you. It's time to start living with a proper view of yourself. It's time to start living with what God says about you, not what you think about yourself. It's time to start living with a fire deep inside of us. What I love about this story is that God finds Moses on the back country in the middle of a desert where Moses thinks he's so far from all the things that he has run, ran from, and God finds him in that moment. Come on, there are people in this room right now that you feel you are so dry spiritually that God could never, ever water your dry, parched souls. And I want to tell you tonight that God specializes in gardening in the middle of deserts. He actually loves it because then he gets the glory for whatever's going on inside of your life. Moses is like, what? How, how in the world is this, fi- this, this, this bush not burning up? It's very interesting to me because what, what we read here is that Moses saw a bush burning, but what intrigued him was that it wasn't burning up. I, I thought that was interesting. I did some study on it because I was wondering, is this like a common thing? And sure enough, in the desert, sometimes things just combust into flames. Bushes will literally ignite because of the intense heat and the rubbing up against its roots that they will actually combust and it will actually burn on fl- uh, 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 up into flame, but it will actually burn completely up. What I find interesting about this is that we can't just run to any flame in our lives that seems to interest us. You know, there's so many people in our lives, the things that we're living with, we're trying to secure ourselves by some other means. We're saying, well, well, if I'm dealing with this, then maybe I'll I'll just go over to this bush over here. This will get me excited inside. This will light a fire inside of me. This will take care of the the, the lack of of interest for a little while. This will take care of a little bit of the the loneliness. This will take care of a little bit of the self-hatred, and we'll run to any bush. I want to remind you that we shouldn't just run to anything that seems to be on fire, but we should run to the fire, the spiritual fire that God provides that can actually be everlasting and sustaining inside of us because it's the only thing that will actually give us true satisfaction. Moses looks closely and he goes, this thing's not burning up. And I see so many Christians and hear so many Christians, and how many times have I thought in my mind, is God really speaking to me? You know, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like sometimes, don't we walk around like, God, I want you to speak to me. Like walking your dog, you're like, what was that? There's a star. Is it the star that the three wise men followed? God, are you speaking to me? And all of a sudden someone honks, you're like, no, that must be it. Jesus, are you, are you trying to speak to me? And all of a sudden, someone hits you. You're like, what? Are you trying to? And we just go out through our lives. How many of us, we don't understand the voice of God, and so we just go from one thing to the next. We're like, God, are you speaking to me? God, are you speaking to me now? God, God, you must be speaking to me. Someone's folding their hands. That's your, you're closing people's hearts right now to the message. And, and you just go, God, are you speaking to me? What I love about this story and so many of the stories in the Bible is that it comes, so often God speaks when it's so ordinary, but he speaks when it's so obvious. Come on, that's should free some of us up. If you're looking to listen to the voice of God, stop looking under every rock, under every pillow, at every sign, at every light, at everything, and stop trying to go, God, are you speaking to me? Let's just start listening to the obvious, ordinary voice of God that comes so clearly to us when we need it the most. Come on, sometimes we're walking around like God is speaking to us all the time. Like, like, well, if he's as close as a friend, he must talk to me like a friend. And so you're just walking around like, what should I say to this? Should I help this person? Listen, God has already said a lot about himself. And if we just listen to the obvious, ordinary things that he said about us, we will actually start to learn his voice even more. And we will actually start hearing very obvious impressions upon our heart because we know the character of God. And so we know whether or not he's speaking or not. We need to just turn to the ordinary obvious voice of God if we ever want to live with the fire of God inside of us. I love it because Moses comes up against a burning bush and fire in scripture is so symbolic of God's spirit. When you look all through at scripture, it's symbolic of God's spirit. Think of the prophet, I always get this wrong, one wrong, Elisha. He's praying and he's saying, God, like, like I, I need you to, to light my, my, my sacrifice on fire. These prophets of Baal are trying to do the same thing. 
And literally, these guys, they're just dancing around, and they're praying, and they're like, God, Baal, you need to, you need to light my, my, my sacrifice on fire. And they're praying, and they're praying, and praying. But Elisha over here, he's like, douse it with water. I don't care. Do whatever you got to do to this thing that makes it look like it cannot be lit on fire. And then he says, Spirit of God, please show these people you're real. And bam, fire comes down. When you look in the New Testament, Jesus says, hey, I'm going to die on a cross, but it's for the best because I'm going to send a helper. The same word, the same connotation of the word that is mentioned in Genesis about Eve at joining Adam. Isn't that interesting? And he says, listen, I, I'm going to send you a helper. How, how great is that? But they wait in an upper room and they wait and they wait and they wait. And all of a sudden the spirit of God comes on them in the form of tongues of fire. Fire is such a spiritual imagery, it's such a, a, a spirit, it's, it's a motif with so much meaning all throughout scriptures, and what's happening in this story is that Moses, he's been running, he's been living with his past, he's been living with all the regret, regret. he's been living with all the guilt, he's been living with all this stuff, and God shows up in his most dry time of his life with his spirit. Come on. Come on, it's time for us to start saying, hey, I just need the obvious presence of God in my life. You know, if, if God can do it for Moses, I need him to do it for me. Come on, there are some people in here that because things have gotten dry in your life, because they feel parched in your life, because your soul feels like it's dead, because when you come to worship and you're lifting up your hands and everybody else around you seems like they're so in tune with God, but your hands are up and you're feeling so numb, I want to tell you that it's in that place that God's spirit is the only thing that can light a fire inside of you and show you that, hey, you're not alone, but I still have purpose for your life. We've got to live with a fire. You know, the Jews right now are waiting for a Savior who we believe has already come. But my question tonight is how many Christians are still waiting for that same Savior? Guys, I, I, I mean it. Like, we can't, we can't profess to be Christians and, believe, and, and act as if he doesn't exist. A pastor in the States calls this Christian atheism, professing that Jesus is alive but living as though he doesn't exist. Why don't we just start walking along and saying, hey, this is dry ground. I'm going to start believing that God is present. Oh, this is plentiful ground. I'm going to start believing that God is present. Oh, this is another. Uh, uh, come on. God is present no matter where we find ourselves. Come on, life is hard, and it's because sin still prevails along, along the ground. But with the power of God, we can step through anything. With the power of God, we can actually walk through anything. With the power of God, we can be sustained through everything. Amen? Come on, I need a clap for that. That was pretty good. <laughs> That's impressive. I think they're recording this, and I'm going to have that on loop on my phone on Monday. <laughs> you know, the easiest way to live out your potential is to live with some fire inside of you. Living with a fire inside of you, living with God's spirit inside of you is the easiest, and I would actually argue the only way to actually live out your potential. Do you hear that? I think living with God's spirit inside of you is the only way and the easiest way to live out your potential. Has anybody ever had this guy, Ty Lopez, show up on your Facebook feed? Ty is the reason why I got rid of Facebook. <laughs> this guy's like always standing in front of a bunch of Lamborghinis, and he's always like, yo, look at my Lamborghinis. You want this? Do my 10-week program, and you'll have all this and more. And then all these women like come around him, and he's like, look, I make so much money. It's the promise of so much potential. And it seems ridiculous, but this is literally the picture of what most of us are doing in this room. Like, hey, I just got to follow a 10-step program, and I'm going to be a millionaire by the time I'm 30. How many of us walked out of high school and said, I want to be a millionaire by the time of, listen, what craziness is that? Come on, what, come on, what craziness is that? What craziness is it to put all these expectations on ourselves without reflecting on how they contribute to a kingdom purpose? God is not worried about your expectations. He's worried about his kingdom advancing in this world. 
I would hate to fight against God. I would hate to try to strive to make a million dollars by the age of 30 without God on my side. I would hate to try to get Lamborghinis and girls and all this kind of stuff without the presence of God in my life. Because when you're fighting against God, you're fighting against the creator of the universe. You're fighting against the designer of your soul. You're fighting against the sovereign Lord. You're fighting against the one who has a plan and a purpose for every living being. You know what's better than fighting against that one? Joining with him. Come on, today, let's just live with a fire and actually understand that God's spirit inside of us gets us to the place we want to go the fastest. And it might switch how we actually think that God is going to get us there, but it is an incredibly, an incredibly satisfying way to live. See, a lot of what God wants to use in our lives is dead until we live with his fire inside of us. I think that there's actual gifts and abilities and talents inside so many people in this room that are just lying dormant and you're feeling useless. But I wanna tell you that it's not that you're useless, it's not that you're, you don't have any talent, it's that they're sleeping and they're waiting to be awoken by the fire of God. It's, it's the only way that this fire is actually gonna come alive. You see, we bought this house not too long ago, actually this past August, and we moved in, and I remember walking through the doors with Emma, it was just this moment, and we decided, you know what, we got, we're gonna, family's gonna grow, we should look for another place, and, and Emma and I walked through with the real estate agent, he's a great guy, I can recommend him, you can get his information later, I don't get any pushback, maybe a little bit, but I'm kidding. We walk in, I walk in, and I looked at Emma and I said, this is the place. We just knew in that moment. First house we had looked at in two years. This is the place. Walked through some other houses and we're like, eh, this is the place. And it just got better. We walked up and there was this like expansive living room. There was a wall taken down between the dining room and the living room. We're like, this is so open and modern. And the walls are light gray. And the floors are dark gray. And this is just beautiful. And I, and I remember just like thinking like, this place is incredible. We walked down the hallway and we're like, wow, the hallway is separated from the living area. We could actually be in our living room and our kids could be asleep and we could not wake them up and live in the same space. You know, we're like, just our minds are being blown. Some of you are like, why does that matter? You'll have kids and you'll figure out. <laughs> Our room was also separate, which was also a nice little added feature as the kids get older. But anyway, you'll figure that out if you're not married. I'm just trying to see if you're awake. We went down the stairs, and, and one of the best features of the house, and you could smell it, actually, if you walk, just drove through the neighborhood. Um, today, on a cold day, you can just smell it. You can just smell it. The fire's going. We walked down into the basement, and then one of the best features, if not the best feature of this house, is there's this uh, brick fireplace painted white. And it was painted white, and, and, uh, and we just walked in. And we're like, this is amazing. We could actually have fires in our house. And, uh, you know, we live, we've lived there for the last four or five months. And the truth is, is that one month went by, and we didn't use the fireplace. Another month went by, and we didn't use the fireplace. And another month went by, and we didn't use the fireplace. And I was starting to get worried. Like, why isn't this fireplace working? What's, what's going on with the fireplace? Like, why, why is it not working? And a couple more days went by, and I'm like, Emma, something's wrong with our house. Call that real estate agent. Tell her church, don't go with the real estate agent. Fireplace doesn't work. And Emma's like, what are you, what are you talking about? I'm like, it's just not working. A few more days go by, it's starting to get cold. And, of course, we know in Canada, that could be like, it could be like the Bahamas one day, and the very next day, you are in hell cold one and then and then Emma's like okay why isn't this fireplace working you know like like she was upset the problem is is that this isn't like a fireplace you just turn on a light switch on the wall and all of a sudden you got a beautiful fireplace this is a kind of fireplace where you literally have to go out to the woods chop down wood take wood bring it over bring it in your house try it out stack it right take it back into your house put it there get some kindling put it down get some newspapers unless you're environmentally friendly and then you put that down there and then you light a match you put it under there you make sure a draft is going and you start lighting the fire the thing i learned about our fireplace is you actually have to light the fire in order for it to work in your life 
Come on, don't blame God for not moving in your life when you're not there stoking the fire or asking for his kindling or asking for him to light a fire inside of you or asking for the spirit to burn bright inside of you and wonder why isn't God using me. The things that God has placed in your life can only come alive when that fire is started. The thing is, is that Moses had passion. He may have acted the wrong way. He may have killed the guy. But what God saw in Moses was not a criminal, was not a murderer. He saw in Moses a man that wanted to see a nation released from captivity. What you thought you acted upon that was done so poorly might just have something connected to it that God actually wants to use. And God said to Moses, listen, killing a guy is not the response to captivity. But come with my Holy Spirit and we'll release an entire nation from the captivity they experienced. Come on, there's some people in this room and you think that some of the actions that you've done in your life disqualify you from partnering with God and releasing the nation that we now live in from the different stressors that it's going through. But I want to tell you tonight that God has placed something inside of you. He's placed a story inside of you. He's placed a a lifetime inside of you. He's placed a past inside of you. He's placed some stuff inside of you that while it might appear yucky, God wants to use it to accomplish his purposes. He wants to release the people around you with the fire that he set inside of you. He's saying, Moses, Moses, I put a passion inside of you. He said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people. He's responding to something that Moses didn't say in this, but he was saying in his heart, God, those people, for 40 years, Moses had realized he had left those people. And God is saying, Moses, I indeed see. He's saying to you tonight, I indeed see your brothers and sisters that you want to see come to me. I do indeed see that son of yours that is so far from me. I indeed see your parents who seem to be so far from me. I indeed see that boss that you can't stand. I indeed see, but I don't want to destroy them. I want to release them. I want to bring them into relationship with me. I want to place my fire inside of them that I placed inside of you. But the only way our passions come alive is through the Spirit of God. Place all the ability in Moses. Verse 11, Moses said, but God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Moses was a stutterer. How in the world am I going to talk to the greatest power of the day when I myself had a, have a stutter? How in the world am I myself going to go help somebody else when I've went through divorce? How in the world am I going to go and help some other family when I can't even get my kids in order? How am I myself going to be able to go and talk to my boss when I can't even get rid of, get along with my coworkers? What God is saying tonight, listen, if I've called you, I will prepare you. He doesn't just call the qualified, he actually qualifies the called. And it's time for us to stand up and start stepping into everything that God has for us. And finally, I thought that it might be worth mentioning that for a lot of us, that influence that we seek is only released when we actually release it to God. It says, and bring the Israelites, God is saying to Moses, and bring the Israelites out of Egypt in verse 11. What good is it being an influencer in a world without the presence of God? Where are you leading them? <laughs> but God is saying, my spirit inside of you, and I'll let you lead a lot of people. I'll, 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 bring, I'll use you to lead a lot of people. God said to Moses, I'm, I'm about to bring these people into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. It sounds weird, but it meant that the cows are fertile and the bees are doing their thing. And the place is good for vegetation. And the food you didn't have in slavery and the food you haven't had while wandering the desert is the food that you will receive when you walk into the will that I have for you. But notice that the the purpose that he planned for Moses wasn't just for Moses, but it was for the people around him. The thing about the Spirit of God is that when it comes alive in you, you know, you will know that the Spirit of God is giving you all the dreams and visions that are on your life when they're connected to people that aren't you. Any vision that puts you at the center of it is not a vision that's from God. God will always place a vision inside of people that is connected to the people that he loves. Come on, can we stand up in this place? I think one of the worst things to do in this life would be to live in this life and live through this life passionless 
dead and numb to everything that's going around inside of you. And I think one of the reasons why you come into an environment like this on a Sunday and we're excited and we're responding in a message and our hands are raised is because God lit a fire in us when we realized that Jesus paid a price for our sin to bring us back in a relationship with him that we could not pay on ourselves or through our own endeavors or through our own efforts, and God did it all. Today, I want to offer you that opportunity to step into that kind of passion, that kind of life, that kind of fire inside of you, in your, in your belly that you just can't shake, that kind of excitement about your life. So with every head bowed and eye closed, the Bible says that whoever calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. Today, the way that we can do that is just lift up, lifting up a hand and saying, Jesus, I want to know you. I want to put you Lord of my life. I want to come into the family of God. If that's you today, on the count of three, I want you to lift up your hand. I'm not going to point you out. This isn't a manipulative moment, but I just want you to put up your hand. I'm just going to pray for you and everybody else that puts up their hand. So on the count of three, one, Jesus loves you. Two, this is your day. Three, if you want to make a decision. Thanks so much for watching. If you were impacted by the message today, you can send us an email at mystory@slatechurch.com. And if you'd like to learn more, you can fill out one of our online connect cards. We would love to see you at one of our Sunday services and make sure to stay connected by following us on any of our social media, including Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram.